You're listening to Listen More with Paige Crystal Wilcox. This is a podcast where people from around the world offer their insights, reflections, and suggestions regarding media representation. Something that's very important for this podcast, as a sign of respect, I ask each guest to introduce themselves in the way that they see fit. So without further ado, could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie Wingo. I am based in the United States in Austin, Texas. I run an advertising agency called Sanders Wingo. I also do a lot of work around this area of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. I'm a strategist in that area, and I'm just committed to making change happen in a very positive way. So that's a little bit about me. In terms of the podcast and when you see yourself reflected in media, what parts of your identity or your situation would you like to speak about? It's so interesting when I think about media and how people show up. I think for me, it's looking at it from an app through the lens of advertising and marketing and how people show up and how they're represented is how, what I think I want to focus on today. In the United States, we spend a lot of time putting people into categories based on certain attributes. Usually it's country of origin or if a person speaks another language outside of English from a media perspective in the U.S. anyway, we're starting to see a lot of cultures blending together. So we used to have these definitive buckets of how people showed up. But now we're starting to see people like myself. I'm, I'm African-American. My husband's Mexican-American. And then we have these little kids. So how do they and how are they going to identify and how is the government going to classify them? Better yet, how do these two little kids start seeing themselves represented in television and radio and film on the Internet? And that becomes an interesting discussion for me. And so this blending of cultures and people and making sure we're telling real authentic stories, not just stories where you plug and play or stories that are not authentically human. I want to make sure that as a marketer, we're staying away from those. And then also when I watch shows or when I'm listening to podcasts or listening to whatever I'm listening to, I want to make sure I'm I'm looking for stories that are truly representative of more than just one aspect of a human being, but just the beautiful layers of complexities that make us human and imperfectly so, which I think is great. I'm excited about the shift in media. I'm hoping that there's more of it and that we look to understand people and places because people from those places and spaces are part of telling the story. Storytelling is such a powerful way to connect with someone else's experience. So, of course, it makes sense to try to do it well. There's this beautiful way of telling stories that are authentically human that don't have to rely on a casting agent to cast appropriately because the people who are involved in that storytelling are involved in actually portraying the story, right? And I look here in the United States and there's this interesting thing that's not only happening with cultures blending together, but also with language. And so it becomes this interesting conversation where we have six hours southwest of me. And there's this interesting group of young people who are coming up who are creating their version of Spanish and English called Spanglish. I don't know another word for it, American English. I'm not, I mean, American Spanish, I'm not really sure. But how that starts to show up in culture and how it's truly represented becomes an amazing part of the storytelling, at least from where I sit. And then also looking at all of these kids that are coming up and growing up and the experiences that maybe they've had in Texas or in California, if they're coming in from South America, how these cultures come together to tell stories and then also remember stories from from their parents and how things were and how they want to see things going forward. So it's it's a really amazing time. And I don't know if I share this with you. My favorite saying is people hate two things change in the way things are. And so as we go through this change, I think we're going to see a lot of push and pull in terms of how we tell these stories and what stories surface to the top of what stories we remember. Can you think of any specific examples where we've tried to showcase that and it has not worked? You know, that's a good question. I think, and I'm, and I'm digging through my, my memory in terms of stories that worked and stories that didn't. I think in the United States, and I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going to stall a little bit so I can think through it. But in the United States, we're seeing this emergence of understanding histories and histories that have were untold, right? When I look at it through the U.S. lens, we have these stories that are told, and I'm Black, so the African-American experience and our histories are people were enslaved, slaves were freed, civil rights, happy ending. But we're finding out is that there were all of these different stories that were never told for whatever reasons they were untold. And so it becomes an interesting conversation of how do you tell these old stories 
in a way that are relevant that makes sense. When I think about storytelling and people who've done it well, I think as of late, my favorite is Watchmen on HBO. I'm not sure if, if people can get HBO programming all over the globe, but it's just this really interesting sci-fi mixture of real life events and then things you know, it's sci-fi. So things that could be maybe possible in the world someplace else. I don't know. But when I think about stories that are told, that are told with one lens, and if I'm going to, I'll stick with the U.S. As I look at stories like Gone with the Wind, where we're going to tell the story of, of the Civil War, but it's so disingenuous, this love story in the middle of Civil War. And then there's all of these things that are happening that just don't make sense. The other one that I think is interesting is that there are, you know, things are the way they were because that's just how they were told. But now we look at them 30, 50 years later, and we're like, why would anybody even tell that story? And so for everybody who's a fan of princess stories, the one that I think is just absolutely creepy is Sleeping Beauty. Or Sleeping Beauty, she's asleep and this prince comes in and he's dashing. And he kisses her while she's asleep. She's passed out. That is so wrong and creepy. But now that we now that we look at it through this new lens, we have an opportunity to actually tell a story that makes sense, not one that is icky and off-putting. When I talk about Sleeping Beauty, there are people who are committed to the story of, well, this was part of my childhood and this is how I grew up and da 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 is cancel culture really canceling Sleeping Beauty? And I'm like, well, it's a creepy, it's a creepy story. So yes, cancel culture is going to cancel Sleeping Beauty. But on the other side, and I know people hate two things, changing the way things are. But on the other side, what are the new stories that we can create about people and not have it be this really off-putting thing where somebody's asleep and they're getting kissed? There's definitely, we can look at things and retell stories in a very new, refreshing way that makes sense and that are appropriate for the generations that we that are here now and for generations to come. And be okay with it, right? Everything's going to change. We know that. And I think it, you know, get comfortable with it because it's time for us to have new stories about real people and real experiences. I'm going to reflect on very much not a real story right now. Actually, I would love to start an entire podcast series discussing cancel culture because it's so many different things and it's complex. The way it is in play in different situations is different. Ghostbusters. So you've got the 1984 film. I started to watch that a few years ago with my partner for the first time as an adult. I'd only seen it as a child and we had to turn it off. I was so deeply upset by Bill Murray's character using his position of power in a university to get vulnerable women into bed. I just felt so angry within myself because... I know of so many situations and have had similar situations in my life with people who are affected by that culture of, oh, yeah, you know, she wouldn't do it if she didn't want to, and just completely ignoring that power imbalance there. That person in that situation may not feel comfortable saying no. The reboot of that 1984 film came out this year. They had a cheeky stab at that part of the original film and I was very glad that they acknowledged it and they sort of flipped it it's a kind of violence mm -hmm. I think that there are so many stories like that where whether it's because we we weren't able to see stuff at the time like you said or just our perspective has changed as we've gotten older it's so difficult I think Sorting through those emotions, being a fan of something that is essentially toxic. You know, it, it's it's interesting. And when you were sharing that story, what came up for me is there is a professor told me there's this, this theory called media effects theory. So what you see in media, your brain is telling you that it's true. And media is television, radio, film, social media, whatever that thing is, whatever you see showing up, your body, your brain is saying this is an this is the reality of what is. And when I look at the United States and the way the U.S. media portrays, I'm going to do it in two places, Black men and how Black men are always criminal. They're, yeah, they, they're shown as criminals or they're doing something that's deep, something that they shouldn't be doing, right? Well, they should have been doing that or they wouldn't have, or they wouldn't have been killed, those kind of things. And we see this portrayed in the media. That does not serve any blackmail, any favors when they are pulled over by police, what the police are seeing on TV, what that goes through their brain versus when they're pulling somebody over, there's a real disconnect. And I think on the other side of that, 
the way we portray men, more specifically white men in the United States, when they've done something wrong, be it they have been charged and convicted of a sexual assault, but we're going to show their their beautiful headshot from when they're in college, not their mugshot. They've done something horrific, and we're going to refer to them as not necessarily as a grown man, but a, a young a young adult, right? And so even the words start to have plays on how people show up in media. Words matter, and how we portray people matter. And if we if we're going to reconcile any of these things, and I'm not saying all people are these things, right? We're not good or bad or ugly or just destructive. But if we're going to show people in media, let's show people in media how they really are and not what we want to show them as to sell more things, right? Or to sell more tickets. We need to look at it at people and talk about people. And just because they're not like us doesn't mean that they are they're good or they're terrible, right? They're they're it's what is the human experience and let's talk about that in a very honest way. To reconcile a lot of that, we have to stop looking at people and these solid groups and and we really need to tell individual stories. It's not necessarily from my view what is the Latin experience in the United States. It is what is your experience as a as a Mexican American growing up in Texas? That becomes very different than if you're Cuban growing up in Miami. The labeling of things and how these labels show up, while I think they are ways to identify people, there has to be a better way of telling these stories outside of the labels that we give folks or labels that they, that they can't escape from. A lot of the people who are in a position to tell stories and to have them heard are not necessarily the same people whose stories need to be told. I agree. Do you have any thoughts about how we can bridge that gap between the people who are actually able to speak up versus the people who are unheard? When I was growing up, all of our news and information basically came from two places. And now there's this unwieldy thing called the internet. And people are being very creative about the stories that they tell and how those story, stories show up. Some of them are good. Like I love following good news movements to see what good things people are doing around the world. And then some of them are just destructive. When we start talking about storytelling, I think, yes, there are people in power and they control the purse strings and they control the stories that are told. But I think there's also people who are coming up and like even with this podcast where you're talking to different people from different backgrounds to figure out what is a secret sauce. And I don't think there's a secret sauce, but I do think this storytelling narrative and how it's been done, it's begging for a disruption. And there is somebody who is out there who's figuring out a way to, so other people can tell stories and have those stories heard in a meaningful way. And it's, and it's not destructive. It's not to, it's not to, it's not for the shock value of something, but it's to actually tell somebody's story for the sake of telling stories. If that is for experience sharing, if that is for creating complex conversations that people need to have or people want to have, or if it's storytelling it's just to get a different perspective, right? And so we can have these amazing complex conversations and we're listening for understanding and we're not trying to defend a position, but just really engaging in someone. There, There's this magic that happens when we listen to a story and someone's willing to be vulnerable and kind and willing to share that story. And I think that needs to be honored and respected. The more we do it, the more the stories will be told. And I think we have to have these stories told because it's not a monolithic world, right? There's all sorts of different people in the world. And I think that that's why the world is an interesting place. The good, the bad, and the ugly. At times it can be very confronting reading or watching some of these stories that include it all but there's so much value in that I really do think that anything that oversimplifies so simplifies someone to one label it it's dehumanizing because there's no no human who is just one thing even with these stories so I was looking back when I was in the third grade the big thing that was changing around language in the United States was this reference to man like chairman of the board chair you know and so the policeman or the fireman and now we're looking at the i remember in the third grade like there was this big deal about you know why do we need to change these words and why do we but now that i look back on it, i'm like well yeah those words needed to change right because men aren't the only ones who can do those things we can all do those things if we choose to do those things and so i think the same holds true as we start telling stories just because the way we did it in the 70s and 80s does not mean it's the way we do it now and the way I grew up in the 70s and 80s is not how I'm going to raise my kid. 
one of the things that my husband and I agreed to when we were newly married was when we had kids, we were going to take them to places so they can experience culture other than what we lived in, right? Or where we're living. And my kids are bilingual. They speak English and Spanish. And it's amazing for us to travel to Mexico where they can be part of the culture and understand the culture, but it's a different culture than what they grew up in. This becomes part of the storytelling where you get to storytell and understand somebody else's experience. I want to dig into that some more. If we ever get past COVID, I really want to make sure that these kids of mine are experiencing cultures so they can also be informed of other stories outside of this neighborhood that we live in, in central Texas, right? What is the story of so-and-so and how does that show up? Or we went to this restaurant and we tried this food because it was a different experience than a, of our own. This is what we liked about it and this is what we didn't like about it because they're kids and they're just honest that way. If we could all look through the world with that view of a, being a kid and looking just because you're just because you want to know more and you want to learn more and it's okay if you don't like it, right? You don't have to like the broccoli, it's fine. But at least you're trying to understand a different perspective. I think that would be wonderful. The curiosity of a child is such an amazing part of developing as a human being, as opposed to like a morbid curiosity. Right. Being attracted to the spectacle of something or something being sensational. This is way before COVID. My friend and I traveled to Argentina and I was warned that people were going to look at me and stare at me because of my hair. And I'm like, I feel like I'm in this show that nobody really understands. I'm just a human. The hair is different, right? It's just a different thing. But I can't imagine how that shows up for other people who are experiencing something that's more significant than hair. I can change my hair, right? I can straighten my hair, but my kids want to understand the hair because their hair is curly, not like mine, but a different kind of curly. And so they're digging into understanding the curl and the curl patterns and how it shows up, not for it to be a weird conversation, but it's this conversation of, I really want to understand how we are alike, not different, not like we're at a circus and it's a, you know, we're watching something and being voyeuristic, but truly this, like this really intentional way of connecting with another human being about things that are very human centric, not things that are just, I don't know how to, I don't know, even know if I'm making any sense, but not just things that are attributes of somebody, right? But how do we connect in a real meaningful way? At least in my experience, I feel like meaning, you need these meaningful connections. Those are hard to find. But I will also say in this crazy world of COVID, I have met some really interesting people because we connect in a different way that is not based on all of these preconceived notions of what should be. There's a push and a pull to it. I don't know what, you know, if there's a perfect avenue to get to get to a, you know, a positive place. But I know that I can do my part in being part of the positive change in that where it is okay to be different than everybody else. It's okay to be part of the group of misfit toys because I live in it all the time. And how do we get more of the misfit toys to come together so we create this world where everybody is just who they are and that is perfectly fine. There's a group of us that are, we're, we're working on a presentation and it's about being a misfit toy because there's four of us, there's four women and we're having this conversation. And one woman, she's, she's a little bit older than me. She said for the first time in her life, maybe five years ago, she finally felt like she belonged. She never felt like she belonged. I'm like, really? I wasn't expecting that. So we had this whole conversation on belonging and how that shows up in different places and different cultures and why she didn't feel like she belonged and why I didn't feel like I belonged. And these misfit toys is when we come together for who knows what reason, right? Universe put us together. I don't know. But I think it's when we find our misfit toys, that tribe of misfit toys that we're able to grow and excel and just be comfortable in our own skin. Are there any final thoughts that you'd really like to share with the audience? In this moment of so much change, I feel that we as a world citizens, we have this incredible opportunity to cause the change that we want to cause and, and be responsible for it and make it, a, and make it very positive. And to do that and to tell stories or create stories about human beings, we really need to dig into cultures of people. Somebody had told me once in the United States, for the most part, part we all speak the same language, which primarily is English. We don't all speak the same culture. I would encourage people to understand culture and then tell a story. And don't be afraid to dig into the culture if you're digging into the culture because you want to understand the culture of the thing. And also understand that people and stories are not monolithic. And that's okay. I hope that 
10 years from now, you and I can revisit this conversation. And instead of having the conversation we'll have now, it becomes more of a conversation of what are the stories that you heard that you love and less of how, how do we create these stories? Because people are going to actually do the work and dig into the thing to make sure that they are telling beautiful stories about real people. Everybody's an expert in their own lives, right? So those cultures are going to be built like layers of a cake. Every layer is going to be juicy and delicious, but everyone's going to be very different. And I think that's where we start to celebrate from. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm excited about the future of storytelling. Me too. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Listen More with Paige Crystal Wilcox. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on this podcast, head to my website, pagecrystalwilcox.com. And don't forget to subscribe and share.